Would you join me in welcoming uh, to inaugurate our 2011-2012 academic year series, my friend Edward Fudge. Whoever could imagine 800 people coming out on a Saturday night to hear an hour-long lecture on hell. <laughs> but by the grace of God, here we are, so let us proceed. We are thankful that this is a, a subject of academic interest to all who know the Lord Jesus. It's not something we need to be concerned about personally. Hell is very much in the news these days. Our measuring stick as we talk about it tonight will be Holy Scripture, which is the canon or rule of all of our faith. In this hour, we will see three views of hell. There are three that have been held through the centuries. What is the end of the wicked in the Old Testament, in the intertestamental literature, and in the New Testament? And then we'll look at church history as the traditional doctrine evolves through the centuries. And finally, ask why does this subject matter? And when we talk about three views of hell, the first view I'm listing is the fire that torments forever. This is the traditional majority view. Majority because almost everybody in the Christian world believes it. Traditional because it's been the view for all the years, at least since Augustine, for most people. But it raises a question that troubles many people. And that question is, what, what, must we conclude from Scripture that God who gave His Son for sinners will keep billions of them alive forever for the purpose of tormenting them without end? If that's what Scripture says, our answer must be yes. We don't have the option of changing that. And yet there are many scholars today, some of the most highly respected in the world among evangelicals as well as other people who are saying, no, that's not what the Bible really says. The traditional view looks for such scriptures as eternal fire of, of eternal punishment and uh, the fire that uh, is not quenched. And, and they say, this is what these passages mean. Some of the scholars who have said, no, that's not what we have to believe based on Scripture, include F.F. F. Bruce, who was probably the best-known Bible commentator of the 20th century, John Stott, who recently passed on to glory, Michael Green, who wrote Evangelism in the New Testament, E. Earl Ellis, who taught for several years at Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, Philip E. Hughes, a reform man who taught at a couple of American seminaries, Tom Albright, who is with us here this evening, and by the way, he is the first acknowledgement in the fire that consumes, because many years ago when I first finished graduate school, I wrote and asked him what are some subjects that need further study, and he mentioned among others, uh, I think it would be interesting, he said, since the word Gehenna appears only in the Gospels, to see how the rest of the New Testament talks about the end of the wicked, and uh, eventually that's something I looked at though it didn't bear fruit for several years in my own study. John McRae from Wheaton Graduate School, his son Rob is here tonight with his wife Judy, and we're glad to have them. John Stackhouse at Regent College, who took the place of J.I. Packer upon his retirement there fairly recently. Dale Moody, who taught at Southern Seminary in Louisville for about 40 years. John Frankie in Pittsburgh. Homer Haley, a Church of Christ scholar, well-respected. Tom Robinson from New York, who is with us today, and uh, taught at Union Seminary, uh, as guest taught at Harvard and Princeton and Abilene Christian and Pepperdine. Clark Pinnock, who was a personal friend and uh, passed to glory earlier this year. Uh, from Canada, John Wenham, an evangelical man in Oxford, England, who was highly respected by Bible-believing Christians in England. Richard Balcom at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, now at Cambridge and who wrote the foreword to the third edition of The Fire That Consumes. And N.T. Wright, who some people say has written more books than he's read. <laughs> that, of course, is a nasty rumor. <laughs> Besides the traditional view, which all of these scholars, among others, say is not necessarily what we have to say the Bible teaches, two other explanations have also been offered. In addition to The Fire That Torments Forever, there's the fire that purifies and eventually restores people to God. This is what's called universal restoration, or the Greek term for it that's commonly used is apokatastasis. This is the view that Rob Bell in his book proposes by asking provocative questions 
though he doesn't really argue for the view in any detail. Uh, someone asked me recently, did you write your third edition in response to Rob Bell? I said, actually not. The first edition of my book came out when Rob Bell was in the third grade. <laughs> then there's the, uh, an edition of The Fire That Purifies, which looks at passages such as God is not willing that any should perish and that he reconciled the world to himself. There's the third view, which I'm going to say tonight is the most biblically consistent view of all three, the fire that consumes, which is the title of my book. This looks at passages such as God is a consuming fire from Deuteronomy and from Hebrews. The wages of sin is death, and if that really means what it sounds like, God destroys both soul and body in hell, and that's the view that I'm presenting this evening. Uh, suggest two things. First of all, do not change your mind tonight. Uh, so there have been people who have said when they hear the material, well, I'm, I'm just going to have to change my mind. Well, don't change it yet. Uh, this is too big a subject for one night to change your mind. Please do challenge your mind tonight, and I hope that you will go home with the idea that there are very much more in the Bible on this subject than you previously thought, and there's a whole lot to think about and study to make up your mind for sure. What can we learn about the end of the wicked from the Old Testament? We'll start there. It's important to ask the right question. We should not go and say, what does the Old Testament say about hell? If we say that, we'll come back and say it doesn't say anything about hell because the word hell is not in the Old Testament uh, as it's found in the New Testament, at least from Gehenna. Furthermore, the Old Testament does not contain a single passage that portrays what the popular traditional image of hell is, of everlasting conscious torment. So it's quite common for those who write from the traditional point of view to start out by saying, we'll talk about hell in the Old Testament. Actually, the Old Testament doesn't say anything about hell. And that's right. That's not the question to ask. What we should ask is, what does the Old Testament say about the end of the wicked? And if we ask it that way, the answer will be truckloads and truckloads that require several trips to bring it all home. The Old Testament Bible, the Hebrew Bible as it is known, is divided by the Jews into three parts. The law, the Torah, the prophets, the Nebaim, and the writings, the Ketubim, or the Psalms are the first of that group. And Jesus speaks of these three groups after his resurrection and talking to his disciples when it says that he says to them, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So he's referring to these three passages or these three divisions of the Old Testament. And we'll look at these one at a time as to how they speak on this subject. Tonight, we'll quickly notice from the Torah that there are prototypes of divine judgment, and there are two in particular which we'll notice. From the prophets, there are predictions of final end of the wicked, and we'll look at four, especially four images of that. And from the writings or the Psalms, there are principles of, of final judgment, and we'll say a word about those first. The principles of divine judgment are not statements that are absolute in the sense of unequivocal from which uh, as a lawyer I would say you could get a summary judgment. This is not going to be that kind of a presentation. I do not uh, try to say to people what I'm going to show you is beyond any reasonable doubt and there's no way an intelligent person could think otherwise. I could say that but it would be stupid of me to do it uh, because you would find some reasonable doubt and then you would say I was stupid and didn't know what I was talking about. So I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is look at it from the standpoint of a civil jury, preponderance of the evidence. What's the greater weight in preponderance of the evidence pointing to? And I think you will not find it difficult if you do that to conclude with me, if, if not tonight, later, uh, that the preponderance of the evidence in Scripture points to the view that I'm espousing rather than the traditional view. For example, in the Psalm 37, of, which is one of many such psalms, well, the, 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 we find these words, do not fret because of evildoers, do not be envious about wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like grass and fade like the green herb. Evildoers will be cut off a little while and the wicked man will be no more. You look in his place and he will not be there. He will perish, they vanish away. And then we say, well, maybe that's talking about this life. Uh, the, the text goes on to say, when the wicked are cut off, you will see it. But what happens when we don't see it? Does that mean God's justice is thwarted? So I, I think passages like this simply say to us at least this much, God has a, an inexorable principle of divine justice 
that those who do evil will finally be cut off and perish and be done away, that those who do good will be blessed, but it doesn't always happen in this life. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't always. And when it doesn't, what does that tell us? I think it suggests at least this much that there will come a time later in another age to come when that will take place. And so these passages do say something, at least indirectly, about the end of the wicked. The Psalms go on and say statements like this, God will break the wicked in pieces. He will slay them, cut them off, blot them out of the book of the living, rain down fire and brimstone on them. They will be like chaff blown away, a snail that melts, one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> Grass cut down, wax that melts, clay pot broken, water that flows away, smoke that vanishes, stubble before the wind. There are at least 70 metaphors and similes in the Old Testament of that sort. And they say the wicked will be like all of these things. Note, please, that these are not literal descriptions. I don't think it is, we're intended to believe that the wicked will finally be uh, ashes per se, literally. They will not be wax that melts, literally. That's not the point. But uh, they, they are not literal, but they do correspond uh, to the thing that is stated. The reality will correspond to the picture. In other words, when this happens at the end of the world, people will look at what happened and say, yes, that fits what God told us in advance. In other words, reality will not be the exact opposite of the pictures. If the picture says the wicked will be no more and the wicked lasts forever, that's just the exact opposite of the picture. If the, if the picture says the wicked will be like a, a straw that burns and they never resemble anything like straw that burns, that would be the opposite of the picture. So it's not that. Somehow it does correspond, even though it's not literally the, the same thing. But there's a variety of pictures. And from this list of pictures, such as the ones we've just named, I believe we can say that there has created a consistent impression. And I would just ask you to consider when you read such expressions as these that we've looked at, what is the impression that you're given? Do you have an impression that these people are all finally restored to God? Do you have an impression that these people are kept alive forever and tormented? Or do you have an impression that somehow they really are done away with and they're not around anymore? This is uh, suggestive, at least, for us to consider. The Torah has these, uh, uh, the Psalms, rather, had these principles. In the Torah, the books of Moses, we have divine prototypes. There are two examples that are notable throughout the rest of the Bible, from the first five books of the Bible, actually both from Genesis, of divine judgment. And we want to say a word briefly about those. Exhibit 1 in honor of Mark being a great trial lawyer. Uh, exhibit one is the flood. God says, here's something that happened. And Jesus says, and others say, this is a picture of what it will be like for the wicked at the end of the world. What happened in the flood? We don't have any doubt or question or problem uh, understanding what these words mean when they're used of the flood. All flesh perished. Everything that had the breath of life died. In this way, God blotted out every living thing. And we don't read that and say, well, actually perish and died don't really mean perish and died. It means they never did perish and they never will die, but they wish they could and they had a miserable time of it. That's not anything anybody ever said about the flood. So this is the background of language such as this as used in the New Testament. Interestingly, the New Testament says this is a picture of what will happen at the end of the world. Uh, it's a preview of the future. Peter says the heavens existed long ago and the world was formed out of water, and through which was water, the world was then destroyed with water. And the present heavens and earth are being kept for fire for the destruction of ungodly men. We have a sense here that Peter is saying something symmetrical. He's saying that just as the old world was destroyed by water, the wicked people at the end will be destroyed by fire. And I simply would raise the question, are we to think that destroyed by water means one thing and destroyed by fire means the exact opposite? Or does it make better sense to say just as they were destroyed by water and we know what that means, in some way that's a picture of what will happen to the wicked when they're destroyed by fire. The second exhibit is Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroyed them as well, and you're familiar with that story. The Lord rained brimstone or burning sulfur and fire out of heaven, and there was nothing left at all except rising smoke. We're told in the New Testament that was a preview of the end of the world as well. 
Peter tells us that God condemns cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes. He's very explicit about what happened to them, having made them an example to, to those who live ungodly thereafter. And the word example, hupodegma, is a regular word for a, a pattern or example or sample of something else. Jude says much the same thing, maybe even stronger. Sodom and Gomorrah, Jude tells us, are exhibited as an example or dogma in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed with fire. There was nothing left except smoke. And that is what will happen to the wicked at the end of the world. Pa next group of passages in the prophets, and we have predictions. There are many more in each of these categories than we have time to talk about tonight. I've just tried to give you an illustrative sampling, but we'll look at four samples from Messianic text here. Each of these passages, by the way, is either quoted in the New Testament and applied to Jesus and the Messiah and the, and the end of the world, or else it is clearly talking about that in its context in the Old Testament. So these are all solid passages. I'm not trying to play any tricks on anybody. Now, the first one says, The wicked will be broken like pottery. Psalm 2, 7 through 9 concludes with this statement about the Messiah. You will break the wicked with a rod of iron. You will dash them in pieces like pottery. And you think of taking a clay pot or, or, or dishes of stone and throwing them on the ground and shattering them to pieces. What's, what's the imagery there? What do you get a picture of? That's what the, Jesus will do with the wicked. Or a second such passage, Psalm 110, verses 5 and 6. Psalm 110, verse 1, by the way, is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. It's found at least 20 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Acts, and Romans, and 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, and Hebrews, and 1 Peter, and Revelation, and maybe others that I missed, but at least in those. Uh, the Psalm 110, 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. But a bit later in the Psalm, it says the Messiah will do this. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. The wicked will be like corpses on a battlefield. And then we have this passage in Isaiah 66, 24, probably the most familiar imagery in the whole Bible for the end of the wicked. The passage says this, speaking of the righteous who inhabit the new Jerusalem, they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. This is a picture, as the verse clearly says, of corpses, not of living people, dead bodies. They're in a place like an old-fashioned city dump, an open kind of dump with, um, with dead animals and maggots crawling everywhere. That's the worm. The worm in Hebrew here is pegarim. Uh, th th this is a maggot. And, the, and he says that the, 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 the wicked will be like that, corpses eaten by worms and smoldering fire, and, uh, and they, will, they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. It'll be disgusting. You hold your nose when you go there. You don't want to throw up. It's a disgusting, abhorrent scene in sight. And then we have in Malachi this picture for our fourth and final example of uh, prophetic utterances. The day is coming, Malachi says, when the wicked will be, the day will be burning like a furnace, and every evildoer will be chaff, and it will set them ablaze, and it will leave them neither root nor branch. How much of them is left if they don't have root or branch left? The wicked will be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day. This is a picture, and it's a picture of the end of the wicked from Malachi. Do we get the picture? What do we, what do we imagine when we hear such uh, passages as these? And again, I would say, let's ask the same, or make the same comments we made before. They will be like broken pottery. Uh, all these pieces of pottery shattered, like corpses piled up on a battlefield. They will be like corpses dumped in the city dump and maggots and fire consuming them bit by bit till they're finally gone. They will be ashes underfoot. When you see those pictures, again, do not think of these as literal descriptions. They will not literally be eaten by worms, I don't think. But it's a, it's a, the reality will correspond to these pictures. And what really happens will be something that, that this is a true picture of. And, we, and people will say, yes, that's what God had said would happen. And it really did fit what he said. The reality will not be the exact opposite of the picture. And so when he says they will be ashes under the soles of the feet, uh, well, that certainly doesn't mean they will never in any way, in shape, form, or fashion, resemble ashes under the soles of the feet. They will be something that you could call that at least. And finally, uh, I would ask, what impression 
Do these images leave with you? Do you say, well, that looks like a picture of people who are tormented forever and ever and, and kept alive for that purpose? Or do you say, that looks like people who are all saved and go to heaven? Or do you say, that looks like a picture of final destruction and extinction? In between the Testaments, a period of time that we frequently call intertestamental period, also known as Second Temple Judaism, uh, those are, are not exactly the same overlapping times, but they cover some of the same period. There, there are the same three views that we've already mentioned that are found in the Jewish literature between the Testaments. And we want to notice briefly four types of Jewish literature that are found during this period of time. There's the Apocrypha. These are the books that are found in, we usually say, the Catholic Bible, but not the Protestant Bible. But it goes back farther than that. They were found in the Hebrew Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but not in the, he not in the Hebrew Old Testament. And so that's something to just to distinguish these books in that way. In the Apocrypha, uh, every, every picture of the end of the wicked is a, is a consuming fire, except one passage clearly different, and that's in the book of Judith. Judith is a heroine who saves her people from an evil tyrant named Holofernes. And at the end of Judith, in the final verse, we have this curse against God's enemies. Woe to the nations that rise up against my race. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance against them in the day of judgment to put fire and worms in their flesh, and they will weep and feel their pain forever. Now here's a real picture of, a, of traditional hell. This is a picture of eternal torment. It's clear what it's saying. That's what it means. There's no doubt about it. There's no way around it. That's what Judith is saying. And so I say, well, yes, that's what Judith is saying. But I would observe that Judith changes thoroughly what Isaiah had said. She's using his imagery of worms and fire, but she changes it entirely. Isaiah had corpses. Judith has living people. Isaiah has them consumed by worm and fire. Judith has them tormented by worm and fire. Isaiah had worms and fire external to the people, devouring them. Judith has worms and fire put inside the people to, to torment them. In Isaiah, this is a picture of shame. It's disgust. In Judith, it's a picture of pain. In Isaiah, the uh, re reaction is disgust. In Judith, it's pity. It's a totally different picture. This is the first time in anything resembling biblical literature that the traditional view of hell is clearly pictured. And it comes in Judith, who totally changes Isaiah quite to the opposite to say it. So I have a little tiny check mark by tormenting fire because it's only in one passage in the Apocrypha, but the rest of the Apocrypha has a consuming fire. If we look next at the Pseudepigrapha, this is a big word for a big collection of uh, books that are hard to put into a collection or to define either for that matter. The word means false writing, and it really is not that they're trying to, to deceive people, but the, the idea was in their day that uh, all the prophets had finished speaking, and if somebody has a new book that they want to present, they can't say, well, this is my book, because people would say, well, you're, you're too late to be speaking from God, and so they gave them names from ancient people when God was still speaking as they understood it. And in, in the pseudepigraphal books, we have both tormenting fire, there's no doubt about it, and we also have consuming fire, there's no doubt about that, and it's probably about 50-50. So under pseudepigrapha, we check both of those with about an equal-sized mark. Then there's the Dead Sea Scrolls. When uh, the first edition of The Fire That Consumes came out in 1982, there were eight, that's the number between seven and nine, eight scrolls from the Dead Sea available in English to non-specialist authors. Uh, now, in the third edition of The Fire That Consumes, when I went to check on that, there were 800. And the, and the chief uh, scholar who was in charge of all of those is a man whose picture is on the next slide, Dr. Florentino Garcia Martinez. Uh, he has put out a two-volume study edition. It's 1,350 pages with Hebrew on one side and English on the other. I read through all the English pages. And then, lo and behold, those say the same thing that the eight scrolls did 30 years ago. And that is that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the consistent picture of the end of the wicked is, con is total destruction. Uh, after I had uh, used Dr. Florentino Garcia Martinez's books, he is a man who lives in Belgium. I was in the Lanier Theological Library one day, and the, uh, the uh, librarian came over and said, I want you to meet this gentleman. This is Dr. Florentino Garcia Martinez. 
And in the picture, he's talking to Charles Mickey about a Dead Sea Scroll. So I got to meet the man in person, and I said to him, tell me, is this what you understand the scrolls to be saying? And he said, yes, it really is. Uh, we should not be dogmatic about the scrolls because they're a bit ambiguous at times. But I think if you be general about it, this is a fair statement to say that's what they say. So the Dead Sea Scrolls in our tick marks are totally consuming fire, and they've got a great big mark by them. And then finally, the rabbinical literature from the rabbis of the Jews uh, in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, in the Jerusalem Talmud, the Mishnah, uh, these, some of this came later than this period of time, but some of it was back in this period. And in, in, the, in the rabbinic writings, according to Strzok and Billerbeck at least, all three views are held, and there's one very interesting example in which rabbis picture universalism. They have a scene in which uh, the people in hell are suffering, but they're listening, and in heaven they're having a great praise celebration, and they sing this wonderful song of praise. And the people in hell say, that's a good song, we should sing it too. So they start singing it also. And then God hears them singing and says to somebody, where's that coming from? And they say, well, that's the people in hell. He said, well, if they can sing that song, they should come up here. So they all come up there. Well, that was what one rabbi said. That wasn't the Jewish view, but it was a view held among the other two, with the other two. And, and the point of all this is the Jewish pe people between the times of the Old and New Testament held all three views at one place or another. And it is not as though there was a Jewish view that everybody held. So when Jesus comes along, we cannot assume that he held a certain view because everybody else did. They didn't all hold one view. We have to read what he says, ask what it means, examine in the light of the Old Testament and other Christian literature as well, and then decide for the proper exegesis what Jesus is really saying. So with that said, we move on to the next little section. What is the end of the wicked in the New Testament? What does the New Testament say? Let's explore together quickly one person at a time. First, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in announcing Jesus and presenting him to Israel, says that at the end of the world, he will be the great harvester. He will gather his wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What does it mean, unquenchable fire? Quench is to put out or extinguish. And these are some quenchers at work. Uh, this thing is on fire. They're putting the fire out. That's what it means to quench. Unquenchable fire is fire that cannot be put out or resisted. And if it cannot be resisted, what does it do? It does what fire is intended to do. It burns until everything is gone. And so unquenchable fire doesn't mean fire that burns forever. It means fire that cannot be resisted or put out until it does what fire is intended to do. In this case, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is a common warning throughout the Old Testament. God says to various peoples, I will come against you with my fire of judgment, and you cannot quench it. In other words, you cannot resist it. It will be destructive. You can't stop it. It is inexorable. It will do what it's intended to do. Then we have Jesus himself who uses a bit of a different language. This is a very uh, familiar passage and one that's quite straightforward. The Lord says, don't fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The word he uses for hell here is, is, uh, is Gehenna. This word is found 12 times in the whole Bible. 11 of them in the Gospels, one of them in the book of James, which says the tongue is set on fire by hell. All 11 that speak of final punishment are found in the Gospels. They're all in the mouth of Jesus. They're all speaking to Jews who live in or around Jerusalem. It's never used of Gentiles. It's never used outside the Gospels. It's never used talking to anybody who doesn't live in or around Jerusalem. Why is that? Because Gehenna is a place in, in the Jewish theological mind that it takes its name from a literal place outside Jerusalem called the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. This is what it looks like today. It's not a bad place to go right now, uh, but you wouldn't want to go there in the eschatological sense at the end of the world. Uh, Jesus uses this word 11 times, and, he, and he's speaking of uh, the place of final punishment. But he says, don't fear man who can kill the body but not the soul. Fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What does it mean to destroy soul and body? It must be something similar to what he means when he says, don't fear man who can kill the body. 
Well, that's uh, the cessation of existence. And so if, if man does that, but God does the total job forever with soul and body, it seems to be just more of the same in a greater sense and a, an expansive kind of meaning. Then Jesus speaks of perishing in the familiar passage, John 3, 16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's a contrast. Eternal life on the one hand, perish on the other. What does perish mean? What does destroy mean? Traditionalist authors uh, frequently say destroy and perish don't always mean annihilation. They are used with figurative senses sometimes. We read of ruined wineskins, and it's the same Greek word. Spoiled food, and it's the same Greek word. And they say that doesn't mean the wineskins are gone. They're just not fit for use anymore. It doesn't mean the food is annihilated or destroyed in the literal sense. It's just not fit for eating. Well, is that what, they, what Jesus means as he uses it? I would suggest that uh, we don't need to think that. The, most of the time in the Gospels, when this Greek word is used, apolumi, it's used in a sense uh, clearly in the context of, of, of death, of, of really dying, of people being uh, assassinated or, or wiped out. And, and these are examples here. The disciples are about to perish in the storm. The Pharisees trying to destroy Jesus. The vineyard owner who executes murderous tenants. The troops that destroy murderers. The crowd wants to destroy Jesus. Uh, an insurrectionist who perished at the hands of Rome. And some perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are all clearly in a literal sense of perish and destroy. And there's no good reason, I suggest, to think that these words mean something different when Jesus uses them of the end of the wicked. R.F. Weymouth, who was a New Testament translator and a Greek scholar, makes this powerful statement. My mind fails to conceive a grosser misinterpretation of language than when the five or six strongest words in the Greek tongue signifying destroy or destruction are explained to mean maintaining an everlasting but wretched existence. To translate black as white is nothing to this. And that was what this particular Greek scholar thought about it. What about the other phrases thought to suggest conscious unending torment in the gospel, such as gnashing of teeth? This is found seven times in the gospels by Jesus. Three times it's in, in speaking of people who are thrown out the door by the bouncer at a party on the hillside. Uh, twice it's used of being expelled from the kingdom of God. And uh, twice it's used of people who are put in a furnace of fire. Gnashing of teeth in these seven passages is not even in a context of fire except two times out of the seven as far as it's explicitly stated. But it has something in common in all seven places. They're all expelled. They're all cast out. They're all given reason to be quite upset with their condition. And they all are gnashing their teeth or in the NIV grinding their teeth. What does it mean to grind the teeth? Think of this example that has nothing to do with hell. Stephen is about to be... Uh, killed by his murderers. He tells them, you have become the murderers and betrayers of God's Holy One. And their reaction is this. They were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him. Grinding their teeth. They're ready to pounce on him like a wild animal and chew him up. They're not in pain. He's about to be. That's what gnashing of teeth means. It's not a picture of pain. It's a picture of anger. And then there's this very wonderful passage in the Old Testament Psalm. It says, the wicked will see the righteous rewarded and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. And even as they are gnashing their teeth at God, they disappear like the wicked witch in the Wizard of Oz. Jesus speaks of eternal punishment. What does that mean? Well, the word eternal, let's notice first, has two meanings in the New Testament. First, it's a quality of the age to come. The, the Greek word for age is ion. The Greek word for eternal is ionios. It means something that belongs to the age to come. And so we have other words, for example, with this word eternal. Eternal salvation. Salvation of the age to come. Eternal redemption. Eternal destruction. Eternal judgment. These are not talking about earthly present day uh, redemptions or earthly present day destructions or judgments. These are the, the end of the world kind. The age to come sort the eschatological type, the, the quality of the age to come. And in that sense, we can read and understand eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. Eternal punishment is punishment of the age to come.
But eternal means more than that. It also sometimes points to results of an action that do not ever end. And so I believe that the eternal punishment will be just as long as the eternal life. But it's talking about the result of the action, not the action itself. And so we have, for example, eternal salvation. That doesn't mean God is forever saving. It means he saves, and when he's finished saving, the salvation lasts forever. We have eternal redemption in Hebrews 9.1. Not that God is forever redeeming, but once redeemed, the redemption is forever. Eternal destruction, 2 Thessalonians 1, same thing. Eternal judgment, Hebrews 6, 2, the day of judgment, not the forever and ever time of judgment, but the judgment, judging takes place, the judgment lasts forever, the outcome of it. The eternal punishment, the result of the punishing, lasts forever. And uh, so this eternal punishment means both quality and quantity, but it's the result it's talking about. And I'll just quickly add this, that this is not just something I made up. In fact, nothing I'm presenting tonight is just something I made up. But uh, this is not, and if you go to Greek grammars, you can find the discussion of these result words, which usually have a certain kind of suffix in Greek, just as in English, uh, certain suffixes indicate result, like M-E-N-T and T-I-O-N in the words we looked at there. But furthermore, what about the word punishment? Somebody says eternal punishment. Uh, one, one traditionalist writer says if they're not suffering conscious torment, there's no other kind of punishment. That's the only thing that qualifies as punishment. Well, what is punishment? Punishment, I suggest, is simply the penal consequences of wrongdoing imposed by a judicial authority on the basis of law. And so in Texas, for example, there's all kinds of punishment for breaking the law. You may have a fine to pay. You might go to jail. You could go to the penitentiary. Worst case, uh, uh, our governor tells us, is capital punishment, which happens every once in a while in Texas. And so these are all punishment, but they're quite different from each other. And it, it's not what they, what they do, what they consist of that makes them punishment, but the fact that they are consequences of wrongdoing imposed by judicial authority on the basis of law. What is the eternal punishment of which Jesus speaks? He says there will be eternal punishment. Well, Lord, what is that punishment? Well, he's already told us God can destroy soul and body in hell. And I say that's a good answer to the question. But Paul is even more specific in 2 Thessalonians 1. He said when Jesus comes, the wicked will be punished with everlasting destruction. He will destroy them. He will punish them with destruction. They will be destroyed. They will be destroyed forever. And that is eternal punishment because they are eternally punished. The result lasts forever. It is never undone. St. Augustine disagreed with what I'm saying tonight, uh, but he said this statement, which I think is a very good statement, and I borrowed it from him with it, without his permission uh, because I like what he said. He said, when a very serious crime is punished by death and the execution of the sentence takes only a minute, no laws consider that minute as the measure of the punishment but rather the fact that the criminal is forever removed from the community of the living. And so those who go to hell and are destroyed forever are forever removed from the society of the, of the living, the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom, the blessedness of all those who are saved. They miss out on that. That's a great part of the punishment by itself. Then there's eternal fire. What is eternal fire? First of all, it's eternal quality fire. It's fire of the age to come. Second of all, it's unending result fire. And so we have Jude again. Sodom and Gomorrah are exhibited as an example of eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? No, they're not. There were legends in the early years that they were, but they were mistaken. They, they, the fire went out a long time ago with Sodom and Gomorrah, but the result lasts still. The fire had eternal results, and Jude says Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of eternal fire. So when Jesus speaks of eternal fire, he, may, he means fire that has results that last forever. James, what does he say about the end of the wicked? Well, he says it'll be death, destruction, riches consume flesh like fire, fatten for the day of slaughter, and save a soul from death if, they, if you turn a sinner from his way. What do those things sound like? Do they sound like people who are restored to salvation? Do they sound like people who are kept alive for eternal torment? Or do they sound like people who are completely wiped out? In the book of Acts, if there ever was a New Testament book that we would expect to find 
a graphic picture of hell, maybe the book of Acts would be that book. They're going out preaching the gospel. Surely they must warn people of what the consequences are if they reject it. This is the time to have it. I mean, where do you have hellfire and brimstone preaching if it's not in evangelistic sermons? And so surely it must be in the book of Acts. In fact, a couple of traditionalist writers in one of the compendiums of, of, of books recently issued makes the statement that, the, that in the book of Acts, the early disciples go throughout the world preaching the gospel, warning people of eternal torment. Well, what, what does the book of Acts contain? First of all, it only contains three references of any sort to final judgment. Two of them don't even say anything about hell at all. One is uh, Acts 17. Paul says God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by Jesus whom he raised from the dead. Then we have Acts uh, 23 or 24 where Paul talks with Felix about judgment, but it doesn't say anything about what it consists of. There's only one passage in the book of Acts that says anything about the substance of the punishment. And that's Acts 3.23, where Peter says that whoever does not listen to Jesus as the prophet of Deuteronomy of 17 or 14, 18, what's the chapter? Scholars? Okay. Uh, he says that Jesus is that prophet, and whoever does not listen to him will be utterly cut off or utterly destroyed from among the people. The word that he uses there is the Greek word ex hold a thruo that means to utterly destroy or root out. In the Old Testament Greek version used by the early church, this is the regular word for capital punishment. It's the word used in the flood story. It's a word that in the background usage in Scripture clearly meant annihilation. What about Paul? How does he describe the end of the wicked? Paul's major words are these three or some form of them. Die, perish, and destroy. Those, in fact, are the major words to follow up on Dr. Albright's suggestion many years ago found throughout the New Testament. Die, perish, and destroy. But Paul also has a couple of other phrases. He speaks of wrath, anger, trouble, and distress. And this reminds us that those who die, perish, and are destroyed in hell don't necessarily do all those things instantaneously. They may be there a while first. There's infinite room in this view for degrees of punishment based on perfect divine justice. In the process of destruction, God may have an enormous variety both as to type of suffering, duration of suffering, and intensity of suffering. But there's room for all of that and they still finally die, perish, and are destroyed. And then Paul also speaks of it as of the people being anathema or accursed. In the Old Testament, Greek uh, Testament, this translates a Hebrew word, cherem, which you have to be careful not to be too close to someone when you say. Uh, but this was a word that was used of what happened to Achan, for example, after Jericho. And it means total wipeout. Uh, and then Paul finally also speaks of those who do not enter God's kingdom, which reminds us that even if there were no punishment in the, in the sense of torment and pain at all, it would be a terrible punishment if, it, if this is all there were to it, that they miss out on God's kingdom. But that's not all there is to it. There's much more as well. Paul and Plato, by the way, use the same Greek words when they talk about death or destruction or corruption or perishing or dying. The difference between Paul and Plato is this. For Paul, these words portray the destiny of those who live and die rejecting God. For Plato, these words will never describe the immortal soul. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. The book of Hebrews speaks of this as the end of the wicked. Worse than physical death, cursed and burned, raging fire that consumes, destroyed, consuming fire. Again, is this more like number one picture, number two picture, or number three picture? Peter and Jude, we've already seen some of this. They tell us that the end of the wicked will be like what happened in the flood. It'll be like what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Blackest darkness, I think of a black hole here, and total annihilation into that. John, uh, who writes the gospel in the epistles and Revelation, lake of fire, what is that? He says that the wicked will be in the lake of fire and brimstone. The, the origin of this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, it's, a, it's pictured as a, as a lake of fire, brimstone and fire. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah had. The second death, uh, John says the lake of fire is the second death. The contrast is to have their names in the book of life. The book of life in those times is a picture of a city register of the living. 
All the living citizens have their names written in the book of life of that city, the book of the living citizens of that city. And if, there, if someone dies, their name is taken out of the book of the living. And so the final choices in Revelation are either your name is written in the book of the living in the eternal city of the living or you're in the lake of fire, which is the second death. It's life or death. In the larger Johannine uh, literature, eternal life is the contrast. John also speaks of smoke ascending. This comes from uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah again. The next morning after Abraham uh, has, has uh, known the city to be destroyed, he goes out and looks where the city used to be. And it says all he could see was the smoke of the land ascending like a furnace. It's like a mushroom-shaped cloud. There's no pain anymore. There's no suffering going on. There's no sound of anyone in agony. It's, there's nothing but silence and rising smoke. And that's what smoke ascending means in the Bible. Sometimes it speaks of smoke ascending forever. If we go to Isaiah chapter 34 and the destruction of Edom, we see where that comes from. And it simply means that once destroyed, the city is always desolate and never is inhabited again. And again, it's the results. So the big question comes, if the traditional doctrine is not required by the language of Scripture, where does it come from and how did it become so popular? The answers are clear in church history, which the second half of my book goes through. It's a matter of Greek philosophy versus Bible teaching. Socrates and Plato had taught that every human has a mortal body inhabited by an immortal soul. That was not held by all the Greeks, but it was held by many of them. The Bible, on the other hand, portrays the human creature as totally mortal. In the beginning, we're told in Genesis 2, 7, God formed man out of dust of the earth. We think of this as his body. He breathed into him breath or spirit of life, and he became a living soul. Living soul is used of animals as well in Genesis. Living soul means a living, united whole being. It's not that we have a soul. It's that we are a soul. And in the King James Version, on one occasion at least, when the Assyrians are killed, uh, when Sennacherib tries to come and God rescues them by thousands, hundreds of thousands of Assyrian soldiers dying, it says the people of Israel go out and look of Judah and behold dead souls, dead bodies, dead people. That's all the word soul means in that context. God alone possesses immortality. We're not naturally immortal. We don't have an immortal soul. We depend on God for existence every moment. And if God doesn't keep us alive, we won't stay alive. Every time the New Testament speaks of human beings immortal, three things are always true and three things are never true. First of all, it's always speaking of the saved. It's never speaking of the lost. There's not any passage in the New Testament that uses the word immortal or immortality of lost people, always the saved. Secondly, it's always whole, the whole person, never a disembodied soul or spirit. And third, it's always in the resurrection, never something that happened at creation or that happens in this life. So we go to the Apostolic Fathers, and now we're going to take a whirlwind tour through church history and wind this thing up, and you'll, uh, you'll say, well, we're through. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't think of a good word to put in that last blank. We hear first from the Apostolic Fathers. These are the people who lived after the Apostles but many of whom were taught by the apostles. When they speak of the end of the wicked in books like the Didache, Barnabas, Ignatius, and Clement, uh, they talk about a fire that consumes. They use language which to me is clearly talking about annihilation. The traditionalist writers say they use language which is clearly talking about eternal torment. That's because when we read the Bible, we read the Bible with different interpretations. They stuck to biblical language, so whatever you think the Bible teaches is what you think they teach. But, of course, I'm right, <laughs> I think. The other guys think I'm not. Then we hear from the apologists. They come in the century following the apostolic fathers, and these are men like Athenagoras and Tertullian. These are converted Greek philosophers who bring with them into the church the Greek doctrine of the immortality of the soul. And so we have such things as this. Plato first goes to church, I say, in uh, Athenagoras, and who says this, for example, since the cause of man's creation is perpetual existence, he must be preserved forever. And he reasons philosophically that all human beings must live forever in eternity because that's what God made us for. doesn't have a Bible, of course. He's using Greek philosophy. Tertullian, uh, his greatest, largest book was De Anima, which means the soul. 
And Tertullian says such uh, jewels as this, the soul does not need saving because it's immortal already of its own self. Jesus came to make the body immortal so that in the resurrection the body could join the immortal soul and we could live forever. Uh, that was what Tertullian thought about it. And then he goes on to say, and when he's discussing Matthew 10, 28, that when Jesus says, fear God who can destroy soul and body in hell, we must not think that Jesus means that God will destroy the soul, for we all know that souls are immortal and cannot be destroyed. Well, if souls are immortal and cannot be destroyed, then my view is wrong. Something's got to happen to them. Either they get converted and go to heaven, or they roast forever in hell, which is what came to be held as the, to, as the view of Scripture. After, after the uh, uh, apologists come the Alexandrians, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria, and they suggested that nothing God does is wasted or without a purpose. If there's a hell of punishment and fire, it must serve a purpose. The purpose must be to reform the people who are there to teach them better so they can all finally be saved. And they ended up teaching what came later to be called universalism or the apocatastasis. Uh, we, then we hear from Arnobius, a, a minor character who rejected Platonism's root of immortal souls and also its fruit of conscious unending torment. Sometimes traditionalist authors say Arnobius was the first person to teach annihilationism. That's not true, but he was the first to teach it on the basis of thoroughly rejecting Platonism in all of its parts. Then we have the great St. Augustine. His book, City of God, has one large section called Book 21, which is devoted to this subject. I have a whole chapter on that in my book. He, let's just say this about it. He uh, endorsed Tertullian's view of eternal torment, and when Augustine said he agreed with it, that kind of said that's what's going to be orthodoxy for the next thousand years. But there come a couple of other important people between this and the next thousand years. First, Anselm in the 12th century, reasoning from uh, feudal ideas of justice, he said, the God is an infinite being. We are finite creatures. If a finite creature violates an infinite being, it's, a, it's an infinite sin. And an infinite offense requires an infinite punishment, but a finite person cannot pay an infinite punishment in a finite period of time. Therefore, finite humans who offend the infinite God must suffer infinite punishment through an infinite period of time, which means unending conscious torment. Well, so that's pretty interesting. There are just uh, <laughs> a few things wrong with that. First of all, it comes from feudal justice, not from the Bible. Secondly, it contradicts what the Bible does say in the Old Testament. When God gave a criminal code to his people, the Jews, he did not say, the punishment that you render for people who do wrong things to other people depends on the, on the stature and the influence and the wealth of the person in the community. So if a poor man does something bad to a rich man, off with his head. But if the rich man does it to the poor man, so much for that. Instead, he says, as you all know the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, treat everybody the same regardless of who they are. That was God's plan. Anselm is basing his on feudal justice that contradicted that. Finally, it occurred to me a number of years ago that even if Anselm's principle was proper, which it isn't, and even if it were true, which it's not, that it would still not apply to prove his point. Because if, you, if a human being were to perish entirely and forever, that would be infinite punishment that is unlimited as to scope and entirety and, and duration. And, then, and, and for me to say that amounted to what a, a cup of coffee would, have, would be worth if you had a nickel, and that's all. But uh, I found in the process of doing research for this third edition, there was a great Reformed theologian named Herman Witsius in the 17th century who uh, was highly regarded in his day by all the Calvinists of Europe. And he said, uh, by the way, folks, Anselm's argument is full of beans. He didn't say that. He wasn't from Texas. But he said, uh, this is not true, and if a man is destroyed forever and entirely, that would be infinite punishment anyway. Then we hear from St. Aquinas, uh, who is highly regarded by just about everybody, 13th century. He said, the soul suffers first because the soul is the one that sins first. Your soul decides to sin, then your body carries it out. And so when you die, your soul goes to hell immediately and you get a head start on suffering and your body catches up later. That was something he contributed to the doctrine. Then we have another A in our series, 
better known as his first name, Dante. Uh, he wrote the uh, Inferno or the Divine Comedy. Interestingly, his lowest level of, of, of a pit, which is reserved for the very worst sinners of all, is freezing cold. And if people had thought about that, the expression would be cold as hell. Uh, and then we come to the Reformation. The Reformation is quite interesting on this point. We'll cover a, a point very quickly here. Luther stretches the envelope. Luther says things like, uh, when, when I die, it will be like a sweet sleep, and I will lie in my grave and sleep until my Savior comes and knocks on the grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up, and then I shall rise and be with him forever. Luther said things like that. Luther said things like, the uh, philosophical arguments for the immortality of the soul belong on the great dung heap of Roman decretals. Sorry, John Michael. Luther said it, not me. But uh, Luther said that. Sir Thomas More, being a seasonal man for every occasion, uh, says to Luther, you're not right at all, and he defended the traditional view. Tyndale, the Bible translator, came to Luther's defense. Calvin, meanwhile, turns his attention to the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists, whom everybody else hated, were saying that when the wicked die, they are, are de they're totally dead to resurrection. When they're raised, they go to hell where they're totally destroyed. They don't have an immortal soul. They don't uh, live forever unless God gives them immortality. In other words, the, the, the Anabaptists, some of them were saying just what I'm saying tonight. Calvin did not like the Anabaptist for many reasons, and this was one of his major ones. He, his first religious book was called Psychopanachia, which is a Greek word that means the soul stays awake all night long. And Calvin, in his usual tactful manner, said things like this. He said, these cursed Anabaptists, whose very name is to damn anything that they say, uh, are spewing forth this from the pits of hell, which we thought was stamped out, but here it is again. And he was ve vehement in his denunciation. Some of his buddies said, hey, Cal, you need to tone this down. Luther's leaning this way on some of these things. And he wrote a new forward to his book and said, there are some good men who err not from malice, but from lack of information and so forth. But Calvin uh, taught his views to Heinrich Bullinger, who wrote what's called the Second Helvetic Confession or Swiss Confession in 1566. And, and this doctrine that was the traditional Catholic doctrine was written into the first Protestant creed or major Protestant creed and it became a model later for the Westminster Confession and later doctrines and statements of faith came to America, became part of fundamentalism and so you had in fundamentalism the liberals who said there ain't no hell and the fundamentalists who said the hell there ain't and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and for about uh, 50 years or so Nobody could even study about hell that, except under the bed sheets because if people saw you studying hell, they would say, you must be a closet liberal. Uh, but these days, that's different, of course, and everybody's talking about the subject. Uh, Alistair McGrath, who was here a while back, had this wonderful statement. Seems to be a general feature, he said, of the history of Christian thought that a period of genuine creativity is immediately followed by petrification and scholasticism. Orthodoxy merely guarded the ashes of the Reformation rather than tending the flame. And so McGrath says they should have continued the Reformation. Many scholars today in many parts of the Christian church are saying that the Reformers did not finish the job. The area they never got to completely was eschatology, which includes hell, and it's up to us to carry forward with that today. And so these men we mentioned earlier and others like them are doing that, and that's what I hope to be a small part of as well. We must finally ask, what difference does it make anyway? Why well, take up an hour of my time on Saturday night talking about hell? Why does it matter? I suggest three reasons. First of all, it's not a salvation issue. You're not going to hell or not going to hell, depending on what you believe about hell. It's, it's how you deal with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a fellowship issue. There should not be any division among Christian people because of this as to fellowship. Unfortunately, there is. My nephew Aaron Fudge, who is here tonight from California, was refused admission into a graduate school program in one evangelical seminary because he believed this view of hell. Uh, and that's not uh, what I would think I would do, an institution of higher learning would do to exemplify the kind of open-minded study of Scripture that they supposedly stand for. So why does it matter? It is important. First of all, it matters because we speak in God's name. If we tell people, I'm telling you what God says on the subject, we need to be careful to try to really say what God says. 
There are plenty of things in the Bible that indicate that God is not very happy when people say, I'm speaking for God, and then they make up what they say and don't say what God said. So we need to be careful just because we're speaking in God's name. Secondly, it matters because this impacts evangelism. Uh, there are many atheists who say, I'm an atheist because I can't believe in the Christian doctrine of hell as they have commonly understood it. That doesn't mean we should change the doctrine just because some people can't take it. If the Bible teaches the traditional view, then that's what we should say no matter what the results. But if the Bible doesn't teach it, then it's a great reason for changing it because it's an impediment to evangelism. And third, it speaks about God's character. Again, if this is what the Bible teaches, that God will keep people alive forever to torment them forever, then it doesn't matter what I think about it. And if I don't think that's a good God or a fair God, tough luck, I'm just a pile of dirt and ashes anyway. Uh, but God is God. On the other hand, if what the Bible really teaches is what I'm saying, then it's a terrible slander against God to say that he will keep people alive forever to torment them without end. It would be much the same as if you had a babysitter who tells your little children in your absence, if you disobey me, I'll tell your parents. And when they come home, they're going to take scissors and cut off all your fingers. Then they're going to cut your heart out with a butcher knife. And then they're going to put you in the microwave until you pop. Uh, I, I don't think you would be hiring that babysitter again. You would, you would not like the way they represent you to your children. So if, if the traditional view is not what God says, how does God feel when people say that's what he really is going to do, especially when he makes atheists out of those who cannot believe it? In conclusion, the teaching we have, have examined tonight and that I presented is not tricky. There's nothing here you've got to remember so it comes out right. It's all pretty face value. There's nothing difficult about it. It's simple and easy to understand. There's nothing complicated about it. In fact, you already know in two scripture verses that you memorized long ago everything I'm wanting to send home with you tonight. The first one is Romans 6:23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Finally, it's death or life. Those are the choices. The second one is John 3:16. God gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The choices are perishing or life. It's that simple and straightforward. It's life or death. And God says to us, choose life.